One of them was Kapil Dev. The very first ball that he received, he hit it for a six. That's how he got selected for the Indian team. Mm. Under Moy, I was appointed as the DPP of the country. Very famously, it was five minutes away from my appointment as uh, as Tommy 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 Tommy. And he said, Sharad, I'm sorry to tell you, but some of your people have been to see the president and they've decided now not to, he's decided not to appoint you as Attorney General. And he used to make fun of Indians. Huh. And one of the things that he used to say in public meetings to make the African audience laugh was that these people, the Mohindis, who eat chapatis. Right? Mohindis and that Indians, chapatis yeah. became the national or became the staple food in the university. Mm -hmm. And there was an instance where one week they were not served with chapatis, they went on strike. <laughs> so I was summoned to State House to go and see President Kenyatta. When I walked in, uh, he looked at me and as I entered, he says, what is this I hear? That you have defied my orders. So the following day, I got a phone call directly from the President, six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And he said, uh, this is Kenyatta. Yeah. And you know that I have sanctioned the prosecution against Kapila. Yeah. So I said, yes, Your Excellency. And he said, now I have put my reputation at stake. Mm. So I want you to prosecute mm. and I want you to succeed. I prosecuted and we lost. Whereupon Karugu went to State House and tendered his resignation. Mm. Not many people know why he resigned. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you now why he resigned. <laughs> mm. But I said I could not enter the club because mm. I was in India. Oh. And I would not accept those kind of things. So I fought it all along. Mm. So he went to complain to the Attorney General. And uh, the Attorney General said, well, if Rao says he will not prosecute, mm. I'm not going to interfere. So they were not prosecuted. And Nehru was the Prime Minister at the time. He didn't agree, he sent in the gun, mm. who was the Minister for Information. So Kenyatta sent a ticket from here mm. at his cost mm. to get uh, Upper Park to come here. That is how close they were. That is. Yeah. The Indians put, went to him and said, that, look, you've done so much for Kenya. Mm. We're so close to President and look how they are being treated. Mm. And I said, Mr. Thornton, mm. I am Rao. He said, oh, the DPP. I said, no, no, I'm not introducing myself. I'm simply telling you, I am Rao. Mm. I am your next door neighbor, but I am an Indian. And my dog is not. I said, my dog is your blood. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Shubhika, and today we are at Mr. Sharad Rao's residence who is former chairman of Judges and Magistrates Betting Board and former director of Public Prosecution. Let's find out about his life, his experiences and much more with me, Shubhrika, on SJ Live. Mr. Sharad Rao is author of Indian Dukhavanas, their contribution to the economic and political development of Kenya and was awarded in 2015 one of Kenya's top presidential awards, Elder of the Burning Spear, EBS, for his distinguished services to the nation. A barrister of Lincoln's in London is former chairman of Kenya Judges and Magistrates Betting Board and a former director of public prosecutions and served on several occasions as Attorney General of Kenya. He is actively involved in sports administration in Kenya and internationally notably as Honorable Legal Advisor to the Commonwealth Games Federation and a member of IOC Court of Arbitration for sports and served as judge on its ad hoc court at the Olympic Games in Athens in 2004, Beijing in 2008 and London in 2012. He also serves on the International Cricket Council's Ethics and Conduct Committee and was one of three members on the tribunal which dealt with spot-fixing allegations against three Pakistani test cricketers and on the dispute resolution panel of the ICC World Cup in 2010 and the FIFA World Cup in 2010. He is also a member of China's prestigious international arbitration body, China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission. Sharaji, you are such a famous personality. You have been associated with law, cricket and many other affairs in the country. And um, your origins come from India. You have uh, studied law and practiced it in London. You're an author of Dukawalas, which actually tells the stories of Indians in Kenya. You have uh, actually roamed all across the globe, but still you feel that uh, Kenya is your home country. Any particular reason behind that? 
Well, because I was born here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I have my affinity, my loyalty to Kenya. To Kenya. And whatever I can do for the country and for its people, mm -hmm. I have done the best that I could. So I've been connected apart from law in various other fields. Uh, sports, as you say, is not just cricket, but sports as generally. And uh, in fact, I led the Kenyan team to the Olympi to the uh, New Zealand, the mm -hmm. Commonwealth Games as yes. the chef de mission. Um, I also represented uh, Kenya in tennis in 1968 at the Olympic Games in uh, Mexico. And since then, I became associated with the Olympic movement here. But that also gave me the opportunity from there to uh, get into the Commonwealth Games. In 1982, I was elected as the honorary legal advisor to the Commonwealth Games Federation. And I was their legal advisor until about four years ago, when particularly my daughters who got me to step down because mm -hmm. they said that as long as I remain the honorary legal advisor, no one else would, have, would be able to Do take that. over that mm -hmm. uh, particular position. So I resigned, and, uh, but they very kindly they made me uh, an honorary life member of the life vice president of Commonwealth Games Federation which I now have. With that, I got associated also with the Olympics, mm. not directly with the Olympics as such, but with what they call the ad hoc panel of arbitration. And fortunately, I've been able to serve on three of those. So I was uh, first appointed as a judge of one, of one of the judges at the Games, Olympic Games in Athens. Uh, that must have been 1908, I think. Uh, then I was immediately after, I was appointed as a judge for the Olympic Games in Beijing. And then uh, soon after that, as a judge at the Olympic Games in London in 1912. So I served on three Olympic Games uh, as a judge of the ad hoc mm -hmm. court. But that apart, my association with the Court of Arbitration was until a few years ago, when because of the age limit, I had to yes. step down. How did you step into law, the field of law? It was not so much out of choice. Okay. Uh, because of financial problems, as I said, I could not continue my studies beyond senior Cambridge. Okay. So when I finished my senior Cambridge, I joined Kenya Shell, and I worked there from 1953, December, when I left school, right up to 1956. Then one of my bosses suggested that I was wasting my time being you know, uh, working for Shell, and that I should aim to do something else. Okay. And he suggested that I should apply, I should think of law, which I did, and applied to one of the inns of court. The barrister's degree is given by one of the four inns of court, okay. Grey's Inn, Lincolnson, Middle Temple. And uh, so I applied to Lincolnson, and fortunately, despite the fact that I hadn't done the A level, oh. and despite the fact that let, I hadn't done Latin, which was compulsory uh, for law students in those days, I was admitted. So I went there in 1956, and I completed my law studies in record time mm -hmm. of just over two years. Mm -hmm. By 1959, because of financial problems, mm -hmm. I could not just stay on. Yeah. Uh, so I thought I would finish it as soon as I could, awesome. so that I'm not a burden on my family. Mm -hmm. And then I came back here in 1959. You have also been associated with cricket which happens to be India's one of the favorite sports. And uh, in Kenya also, we had a team in the World Cup, but I don't know, if, uh, for some reasons, presently, it's not uh, that active. I was never directly involved with mm. cricket, okay. cricket as uh, administration. Mm -hmm. I was administratively connected with the Olympic Games, mm -hmm. with the Commonwealth Games. Um, I was president of Kenya Badminton Association. Mm -hmm. I was a president of the Kenya Lawn Tennis Association. I was vice president of the Kenya Hockey Union. <laughs> but I never served on the cricket as such. Cricket as such. But I played cricket. Oh. I played a lot of cricket. Okay. So I captained uh, the Law Society team. Mm. I captained, as it were, a team that we had just formed as Maharashtra Mandal team. Uh -huh. And where we collected some 11 players. Okay. And we used to play in the league mm. almost every Sunday. So in 1978, when I was president of uh, Nairobi Gymkhana, it used to be called the Suleiman Virji Indian Gymkhana okay. at the time. I went to India and I met uh, Raj Singh Dungarpur. Okay. You may remember 
because of his association with cricket and because of his association with uh, Lata Mangeshkar. So I met uh, Raj Singh Dungarpur and we agreed that we would get a CCI team. As we could not get a team from as India, India. we decided that we would have the Cricket Club of uh, India, India to send a team. And in that team uh, of uh, some of the very prominent cricketers who became prominent after they came to Kenya, mm. uh, came. And one of them was Kapil Dev. Okay, Kapil Dev. Kapil Dev, yeah. In fact, Kapil Dev was the last one that we recruited. So when Kapil Dev came here and played at Suleiman Virji Indian Jumkana, mm. the very first ball that he received, he hit it for a six. Oh. And it went on to that highway, the <laughs> forest road. <laughs> that's how he made his debut. Okay. That's how he got known for cricket, for in, cricket India. in India. And that's how he got selected for the Indian team mm. after that. yeah. If you look at Kenyan history, there are many Indians who have played a major role in uh, building up the nation, or you can say played a major role in creating what Kenya is presently. So what do you have to say about it? Well, as one governor put it, he said railway is the beginning of all history of Kenya. As a nation. And the, build, the railway was built by Indians. Ah. So when they started in 1895, mm -hmm. they decided at a great cost, and there was a lot of opposition in England to building the railway. Okay. But eventually there was agreement in the House of Commons that mm -hmm. they should build this railway because they were wanted to, uh, they said it, they would be able to go right into Uganda mm. if the Kenya-Uganda railway was built. Okay. And they would be able to, con to have a better enforcement uh, of, uh, of, of the British law here. And also because they were against slave trade and they felt that if they went to Uganda, hmm. they would be able to stop this, uh, stop slave trade, which they did. So the Indians started building the railway in 1895. It was completed in 1902. And as they built it, they put up small, what they would, kiosks yeah. along the line. Yeah. That's actually the story yeah. of your book, yeah? That's right. So, so many Indians who came afterwards, yeah and set up this little kiosk, mm -hmm. which were called dukas, because okay. duka comes from dukan, the Indian ah, word dukan, yes. and they were called the dukan, mm -hmm. duka. Yeah. And the British called us, I think rather derogatively, mm -hmm. the duka valas. Okay. Right? <laughs> so my book, The Duka Valas, ah. talks about India's, uh, the Indian's contribution towards ah. political and economic development of Kenya. Okay. So Kenya was a lot mm. uh, to Indians because not only did they build the railway, they built these dukas along dukas, the line exactly and they went the to the remotest of parts of Kenya. Okay. So in those days, if you went to anywhere in Kenya, uh -huh. you would find at least one duka. Oh. And that duka was owned by an Indian who okay. lived there with his family. He had a shop in front and he lived there at the, just behind the shop. So, you also have Indian origins and your parents came to this country long back. Uh, what was the story behind that? How did you, your parents arrive? My parents country? came here in 1931, in May 1931. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was that my mother was involved in the Indian freedom movement. She was uh, in the Quit India movement. Mm -hmm. She was number two to the very famous uh, politician in India, the lady politician. Uh, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyaya and she went to jail several times because of it and I believe that their first child uh, died when she was in prison and my, fa my father thought that mm -hmm. first he would not tell her about it until she got released from prison and he thought that the best way then to get her out of the political movement was to leave the country. the country. That's how we had decided, he had already made through some contract mm. arrangements to come and work for an oil company in Kenya. Yeah. And so immediately she was released. Mm. Within a week or fortnight, mm. is they left by sea okay. for India, for Kenya. We are two brothers, um, both born here. My elder brother, who was passed away now, uh, he was born in 1934 and I was born in October 1935. You have seen uh, the whole history all these years through your own eyes. You have worked with quite a few big personalities in Kenya, even the presidents. How was your experience as a person of Indian origin or how was your experience, you know, well, let me, otherwise? Let me refer to this article which yeah. was in The Nation. Mm -hmm. 
and the article in the nation uh, said Jomo, who mm. was our first president, mm. the Uhuru, who before President Ruto was the last, was last president, he said, from Jomo to Uhuru, rouse nine lives. Oh. So that, as I was privileged to yes. actually have served, right from Jomo, Jomo. Kenyatta, to Moi, which is the first president, to Kibaki, yeah. yes. to Uhuru. Oh, yeah. uh, so my first appointment uh, in the Kenyatta government hmm. was as assistant director of public prosecutions hmm. and that was in 1970 hmm. and that was because until then all the directors of public prosecutions were Europeans and they wanted to Africanize that was at that post and the person they had in mind called James Karugu uh, who was a senior state counsel in that office but they felt that he didn't have enough experience so I was approached, I was in private practice and I had a very good criminal practice, quite known in the, uh, in the legal profession, particularly on the criminal side. So they asked me whether I could join the chambers just for a period of six months okay. to sort of uh, assist him. Yes. And they created a position for me hmm. as the assistant DPP. And I worked there from 1970 and rather than six months, they asked me to then carry on. Under Moy, I was appointed as the DPP of the country and also served a number of times as the Attorney General of the country. Was not, ever, did not become the Attorney General. Uh, very famously, it was five minutes away from my appointment as, uh, as Attorney, Attorney, Attorney General. General, where the President was going to announce it and I was told he was going to announce it okay. at 12 o'clock on a certain day. But as it happens, and mm. one of the obstacles and one of the objections as, which I have yeah. faced, as I said, mm -hmm. in that article, okay. despite his uh, round, roused nine lives, nine lives, was an objection by some of the Indians. Some Indians who went to see the president, mm. objected to my appointment as possible appointment as oh. Attorney General. Okay. And just five minutes before 12, I was telephoned by the head of civil service, uh, which was Charles Nachai at the time. And he said, Sharad, I'm sorry to tell you, but some of your people have been to see the president and they've decided now not to, he has decided not to appoint you as Attorney General. Uh, so as the press is standing outside, he will make an announcement and he has in mind Justice Moody True. who would be appointed. So once he is appointed, please accept it, go and see Moody and do try and work under him. So that's how. But you have received one of the greatest recognitions in the country. In 2015, you got Elders of Burning Spear. EBS, yes. yes. Elders EBS. of Burning Spear. So, yeah. how did that happen? And how was your feeling, you know, after quite a few disappointments, if you get an award? Well, as I case? said, I joined as Assistant DPP mm. under Jomo Kenyatta. Mm. And to be quite frank, under Jomo Kenyatta, that's the highest position an Indian could have. Mm. Because Kenyatta was opposed to any Indian being appointed to the rank of a, a, a principal secretary. That's how it remained. So it was not until Moy became president that I was appointed the DPP, okay. uh, which was equivalent to a principal uh, uh, office secretary. Mm. So when I was appointed, uh, I should think it was 1982. So having served for 12 years as assistant DPP, in 82 I was appointed the DPP. You have served the nation on highest positions and, uh, you know, even now you are so active. So give us one mantra, you know, for the young generation who actually, um, you know, tend to lose hopes every second moment. In fact, I'd, I think the present day Indian should not lose any hopes. Mm. Because in our days, I think it was difficult for yeah. an Indian to be Get in a, a position like yeah. what I had. Uh, when I became DPP, that was the highest position that an Indian could ever be mm. appointed to. And that was, as I said, in Moy's time. Mm. In uh, Kenyatta's time, you could not be appointed to that kind of position. But uh, subsequently, yes, a few other Indians in the judiciary, particularly even the Chief Justices. We had two of our Indians and Chief Justice of Kenya. Uh, so it is now open, and I think uh, that discrimination that prevailed in those days is no longer applicable yeah. because also the hostility that prevailed among mm. between Indians and Africans at the time, mm. we as the haves and they as the have-nots, mm. has disappeared. 
yes. because they are also in the same position or better also mm. uh, in mater materially, financially, in businesses and all that. So that, that hostility which was between Indians and Africans has disappeared. So we are at par now okay. with Africans. But Kenya still depends a lot on Indians. Uh, one, as far as businesses are concerned, as far as industries are concerned, uh, as far as welfare organizations are concerned, we are, a, I think, a population of 0.02% of yeah. Kenya. Yeah. And, and almost all the welfare projects, all the charitable projects in Kenya are supported almost wholly by Indians. Right. I'm told that 50 to 60,000 children are being fed every, every day, day by Indians. Yes. And you look at various hospitals, schools, so many other institutions that they have supported. Uh, the MP Shah Hospital came in, the Aga Khan Hospital came in, the recent one, the Jalaram Hospital came in, where you get subsidized right. treatment. Yes. You see? So the Indians have done very well as far as Kenya is concerned in all aspects of welfare mm. and in many other fields. And I too have been connected in many of those. I think yes. I had, when I was a DPP and I was, I founded what was the Heart Foundation in those days. We had so many children uh, who were treated by teams that we brought out from England, from America, who were operated, operated free of charge. So we set, I set up the Heart Foundation which was very well supported and supported by Jomo Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. People used to go and donate the money mm -hmm. to Kenyatta and immediately the check would be on my table the same day or the following day. So after that, I've been involved in various other welfare organizations, uh, the Karura Forest being one. And my latest venture is actually we have set up uh, on the basis of the Usha Silai mm -hmm. in India. We have started with yes. my own funds and yeah. funds from a friend of ours, we have set up a sewing. And that's a fantastic project. Yeah. I have actually right. visited that and yeah. super successful. Very successful. Yeah. From We set it up in May yeah. and of about a thousand uh, uh, women and young uh, youth we have uh, trained to sew. They have been guaranteed employment in the EPZ, in the mm. Export Promotion Zone. Promotion. So about 999 Mm. have already been employed yes, if in the zone yeah. and we have a target this year say for nine to ten thousand mm. or twelve thousand which i think we will achieve yeah. at the same time we are looking at introducing the handloom project mm. based on gandhi's charka mm. gandhi's charka and we found that gandhi's charka is not quite suitable for our conditions here mm. because it means that the person weaving Mm. has to sit on the floor no, as I Gandhi did. Yeah. And that doesn't quite suit them. Yeah. So we have now adopted or decided to adopt a charka which comes from Europe. It comes mm. from Holland actually. And there it is pedal driven. Yeah. And it can be operated by a person Canadians, yeah. sitting on a chair. Yeah. And uh, that we found uh, we were asking uh, the government of India through the Indian High Commissioner to actually assist us in getting from India. Mm. But then we found that it can be made by the Jua Kali in Kenya. No, locally. For about 9,000 shillings. Mm, that's great. So we have now decided that to, to also promote the Jua Kali yeah, yeah, industry yeah. that will make those charkas here. Right? If you see the cultures between the two countries, Kenya and India, you know, even the food culture is somehow getting uh, similar. And, uh, you know, chapati, chapati is eaten by Indians, loved by Indians. Now, even Kenyan, uh, you see, it has entered the Kenyan culture so much. And you know the stories behind that. You know, How did that happen? <laughs> you know, it is strange that uh, Kenyatta somehow, mm. after he was released, and in spite of all the assistance that uh, Indians had given him, India had given him, Appa Pant, who was the first Indian High Commissioner to Kenya, had given him, mm -hmm. and they were very close friends. Somehow, after he became president, mm. I think either because of the... Uh, he wanted Indians to leave their businesses, mm. hand them over to Africans, etc. Mm. He sort of de developed quite unexplained a kind of hostility towards Indians. Okay. And he used to make fun of Indians. Huh. And one of the things that he used to say in public meetings to make the African audience laugh was that these people, the Mohindis, who eat chapatis, 
right? Winnie's and then Indians, chapatis yeah. became mm. the national or became the staple food in the university. Mm. <laughs> and there was an instance when one week they were not served with chapatis, they went on strike. <laughs> so they went on strike <laughs> and they went and rampaged. They they went out onto the highway, mm. the damaged cars which were passing by. And some 61, I think 60 or 68 of them were arrested and taken to committee prison. Kenyan students uh, arrested. African students, African yeah. Students. So at that time, uh, Kenyatta said that he wanted all of them jailed. Okay. So he told my boss, the attorney general, hmm. any such case, he would say, tell Rao, I want those people in jail. <laughs> so I was told when uh, my boss, Charles Junjo, came and said, Kenyatta has said that he wants you to send these people to jail. And I looked at him and I said, I can't. He says, what do you mean you can't? Yeah. I said, look, 68 or 70 have been arrested. If they plead not guilty in court, we are not in the position to prove that they were actually involved in the riot. And who did what in the riot? Because there were no cameras no one mm. at the time. So I said, it would not be possible. Mm. <clears throat> so I was summoned to State House to go and see President Kenyatta. And when I walked in... Uh, he looked at me, and as I entered, he says, what is this I hear? That you have defied my orders. So I said, President, can I say something? He said, what is there to say? I have said, I want those people in jail, you understand? That's what I want you to do. So I said, that is exactly the pres president I can't do. And let me tell you why. <laughs> because I said, if I take them to court and they plead not guilty, I would not be able to prove it. True. So he looked at me and he said, you heard me. I want them in jail. So I said, President, can I suggest? As you want me to take them to court, I will take them to court. And can I suggest when I go to court and I stand up to prosecute, you will send me an order and stop me from prosecuting. His eyes flashed, he knew that there was political advantages there now. Yeah. So he said, fine. Okay. Twelve o'clock. Mm. You know, twelve o'clock, I will go on the on TV and announce that I ordered you not, not to release those students. And at twelve, they should be walking out from a community prison. You understand? Mm. So I looked at my watch and I said, President, it is twenty to twelve. <laughs> so the... And the officer in charge, the, the commissioner of police who was there, Gethi, he said, sir, don't worry, we'll manage. We got into his car, we went to court number one, I got the court to interrupt, to be interrupted, and I went and saw the chief magistrate in chambers and told him that I wanted him to bring all those 68 fights uh, in court. So when that happened, just about five minutes before 12, when I stood up, somebody walked in and gave, handed me a piece of paper I looked at it and I said, Your Honor, I am entering nolle prosequi. That means that I am not proceeding with the cases. And he was completely startled. He says, Are you sure? I said, Of course, mm -hmm. I'm sure. So those 68 was released just five minutes before 12. Yeah. Yeah. And that day, Kenyatta, who was disliked by the students, mm. drove from State House past the students' uh, quarters, which are on the way in his open uh, vehicle, waving the whisk. Mm -hmm. And all the students had come out, yeah. waving at him, mm -hmm. thanking him for mm -hmm. what he had done. Oh, that's all great. Right. Tell us something about your wife, Lina Ji. How did you meet her? She comes from a very recognized family in India. And um, ours is an arranged marriage. You know, we are, uh, particularly in those days, uh, in the 60s, even among Indians, you could only marry First of all, an Indian, hmm. and secondly, it had to be Indian from the same community, yes. from the same caste, yes. and, and, and so on. So there was no one eligible, as far as I was concerned, from my community. Yeah. <laughs> so we had only two or four we were at the time in Kenya. So a friend of ours who was belonged to my community, and he was working for the United Nations, he came up with a proposal that he could arrange a... Oh. Uh, uh, a match yeah. with Lena in Bombay, mm -hmm. and that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen her, she hadn't seen me. We exchanged photographs, and the photographs that I sent him was a photograph. I was standing outside my Mercedes Benz, and she said later, 
that it was the Mercedes that attracted him. And she Not, comes from a Bollywood family, I must say. Bollywood became after. After that. After. Her brother became very famous. Yeah. As far as uh, cinemas are concerned, as mm. far as theatre is concerned. It was more of a theatre mm. and more of a author mm. of plays and things like that. Professionally, you're very, very successful. And, uh, you know, you have seen so many um, things through your own eyes. So, tell us a few more stories which actually I'm missing on to ask you. Well, cases-wise, I think uh, <clears throat> three or four cases mm. uh, come to mind. Mm. The very first big criminal case that I did mm. was called Bassans. Okay. Bassan was an Indian, a tennis player. That's how I knew him. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got instructed in that particular okay. case. He was accused of mm. having arranged a gang of Africans to kill his wife and the children. Oh. And this happened in Neri, on the road to the, the strip to the Neri airport. And so he had arranged this and he had the entire family slashed by pangas, mm. except one small girl who survived. Uh, and he himself had only a few Mm. Uh, cuts on his back to show that he had, he said he had run away, hid in the bush. Mm -hmm. And that story did wash with, uh, with the court. So that was my first big criminal case. Mm. Uh, but there were several others, particularly after I became the DPP, assistant DPP, DPP. And I would think that the two most famous cases of those, only one what uh, divided the Asian community. Okay. Uh, majority of them against me for prosecuting, where we prosecuted uh, one of the most, uh, the okay. leading criminal lawyer, Achoka Pilla, okay. who had defended Kenyatta, mm. and um, he was charged mm. for having foreign currency, and also for having uh, sent foreign currency out of, in violation of the exchange control regulations. But because he had defended Kenyatta, uh, we had to go to Kenyatta to ask for permission to actually charge him for, for this particular offence, the exchange control offence. And after agonising quite a lot, uh, he agreed for reasons which I really don't have to go into. Uh, I was reluctant. I told my boss, I said, look, I'm not keen to do it because we come from, the, I had worked with him in many cases. I'd worked for him, comes from the same community. We have had social intercourse. So I said, for me to prosecute him is not possible. Mm -hmm. So the following day, I got a phone call directly from the president, six o'clock in the morning. Mm. And he said, uh, this is Kenyatta. Mm. And you know that I have sanctioned the prosecution against Kapila. Mm. So I said, yes, Your Excellency. And he said, now I have put my reputation at stake. Mm. So I want you to prosecute mm. and I want you to succeed. So I told John Joe, the Attorney General, that I ordered you to prosecute. You understand? So that's where my orders came from. <laughs> so, so there was no way I could refuse. Yeah, you I could did. not even give an yeah, explanation so, to that. So in spite of being reluctant to mm. actually prosecute the case myself, mm. uh, I did prosecute. Mm. And eventually he did uh, got convicted and he was sentenced to imprisonment. But eventually I helped him to have the sentence uh, reduced mm -hmm. to a term that he had already served, two and a half months or so, and he was released. Nice. Yeah. So that was one case mm -hmm. which divided the Asian community. The second historic uh, uh, trial was the first treason trial in Kenya. A treason trial where a person called Andrew Mutemba was charged with treason. Okay. And uh, Andrew Mutemba happened to be a distant cousin of Charles John Jodet, Attorney General. And it was perceived that I was quite close to Charles John Joe. Okay. And I had advised that he was, Charles John Joe? he was the Attorney General at the time, okay, the first that Attorney time. General, hmm. and a very powerful figure. Okay. So it was felt that uh, I had advised the, the now the new, the person who had succeeded John Joe as the Attorney General, mm -hmm. Karugu, and I was the DPP. Mm -hmm. And I said that they, we did not have enough evidence mm -hmm. to prosecute Andrew Mutemba. And also that it wasn't that serious a treason case. Technically, it was treason, but to warrant a capital mm. charge, uh, so, so, you know, conviction of being sentenced to death by hanging. Mm. So I said I'm not in favor. So that matter reached the president, uh, President uh, 
Moy was the president at the time. So we were both summoned to State House, and uh, Moy said that I'm told that Rao is not in favor of prosecuting Mutamba. Okay. So what is your view? So the Attorney General Karugu at the time said, no, I think it's serious enough and it should be prosecuted. And he turned around to me. I said, uh, well, it is treason, technically treason, but I don't think it's that serious a treason charge mm. that should warrant uh, being our first treason trial in Kenya. Secondly, I don't think that we could succeed because the evidence is rather weak. Mm. So Karugu said, no, I don't agree. Mm. We can prosecute and we will succeed. So the president turned around and said, what if you don't succeed? So he asked me. I said, I have told you, president, mm -hmm. that if we prosecute, we will not succeed. Then he said, and, but we can take a plea. We can take a plea to lesser charge. He will plead and he will go to jail for six or seven years. So he asked Karugu and Karugu said, no, I want him to be prosecuted for treason. And I can guarantee that he will succeed. Mm -hmm. And so Moy said, what if you don't succeed? He said, then I'll resign. Right? So it was agreed that we will prosecute. And But uh, the president then said to Karugu, but I want Rao to prosecute. Mm -hmm. Is that so? Agreed? So that is how I then prosecuted a case which I was not keen to prosecute. I prosecuted and we lost. Whereupon Karugu went to State House and tendered his resignation. Not many people know why he resigned. Yeah, he resigned. I'm telling you now why he resigned. <laughs> he resigned because he had told the president that if the case failed, he would resign. He resign. And he did resign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was a very famous uh, Mutemba trial. In spite of all these hurdles and all these uh, things you have still made through your way and so successfully, what was the mantra behind that? Well, I was, I was quite determined that, uh, you know, one thing... I was very much against discrimination. Mm. You know, I fought discrimination right the way through. Because in sports also we faced discrimination. Yes. We could go, we go to play tennis at uh, these European clubs. They wouldn't allow us to use the changing rooms. Mm. As president of Kenya Lawn Tennis Association, they asked me to give the prizes at uh, Thika Club. Mm. But I said I could not enter the club because mm. I was an Indian. Oh. And I would not accept those kind of things. So I fought it all along. So I fought discrimination in Joe, you were born and brought up in Kenya? Yeah. Oh yeah, my yeah, God. Still, they just... used to consider you as an Indian. Yeah, yeah. There was discrimination, racial discrimination. Yeah. You know, those those clubs were for Europeans only. Mm -hmm. There were these, uh, hosp these uh, hospitals which were Europeans only. The restaurants or the hotels were for Europeans only. Mm -hmm. That's the kind. And we used to go and protest. We would sit outside eating our own chocolate <laughs> and this. We are not going to serve you. I said, okay, we'll eat our own chocolate we mm -hmm. brought. That kind of thing. So we had that kind of history. We have fought discrimination all the way. Yeah. yeah. So how do you feel now, you know, looking at all these years of success? No, as I said, even after so after independence, mm -hmm. where of course now the discrimination had gone, mm -hmm. but there was a kind of discrimination because in jobs and things they were given preference to yes. Africans rather than Indians. Indians. And then they took then they tried to take away the licenses of this, they called, ordered the shops to be closed, be handed over to Indians. And then also, yes, I think I should mention, because the Minister for Trade at the time mm. of Commerce came to see you, a man called Dr. Keanu, and he said, many Indians are not complying with the order, and I want you to prosecute them. And I looked at him and I said, Minister, I'm sorry, I will not prosecute. Mm. He said, what? He says, this is a cabinet decision, it was presided by uh, President Kenyatta, I said, maybe, but I will not prosecute. And because as DPP, I said, I don't think that it was constitutional. I don't think it was fair. And even if the order came from a cabinet that was presided by Jumo Kenyatta, I'm sorry, I will not prosecute. Mm -hmm. So he went to complain to the Attorney General. And uh, the Attorney General said, well, if Rao says he will not prosecute, mm -hmm. I'm not going to interfere. So they were not prosecuted. Even our first High Commissioner, Papa Pant, Indian High Commissioner, it is said that he helped a lot in making the nation free in the freedom struggle of Kenya. But once the country got freedom, you know, he was kept aside. And he was not given that kind of privilege no, no, and importance he was no, deserving. No, not really kept aside. You yeah. see, what happened that it was very close to 
to Kenyatta. Mm. He had Kenyatta and so many of the freedom fighters. They used to come and hide in his house. Mm. He wasn't allowed to live in this area because mm. it was European only. Mm. So he lived in a house in Third Avenue or Second okay. Avenue, Parklands. Mm. But he used to give them financial aid. He used to advise them. He used to, you know, in all sorts of ways, help the freedom movement in Kenya. Yes. In fact, I think he was really the person, pivotal mm. person mm. behind Kenya becoming independent. Mm. So when Kenya did become independent, uh, Kenyatta said that, uh, asked the Indian government mm. to send him as their representative mm. to the independent celebrations. Mm. And Nehru was the prime minister at the time. He didn't agree, he sent in the Vigand, mm. who was the minister for information. So Kenyatta sent a ticket from here mm. at his cost mm. to get uh, Apopan to come here. Okay. That is how close they were. That is. Yeah. That closeness was actually went missing, yeah? After... No, no, no. His closeness with the president remained. Okay. Uh, there was a time when uh, Papa Pant came here. Mm. He was uh, a director on Kirloskers. Okay. He came here as a director of Kirloskers because they have an okay. establishment here. Uh, at the time, there was a debate going on, very anti-Indian debate mm -hmm. uh, against Indians being called exploiters, this, that, and another, in parliament. It went on for days and days and days. So when Abba Pant came here, the Indians put, went to him and said that, look, you've done so much for Kenya, mm. you're so close to president, and look how they are being, being treated. Mm. So Pant said, okay, let's go and see Kenyatta. Can you arrange mm. an appointment for me? So I, with Charles Jojo, who was, of course, a very powerful individual at the time, we arranged an appointment for him to see uh, Kenyatta. And he said, you will drive him. So I drove him to State House in Nakuru. And Kenyatta was waiting for Upper Panth to arrive. Okay. And when we reached the when we reached State House, he came out and he greeted, much to the astonishment of everyone there. He said, How are you, Appa? Mm. You see, and hugged him. <laughs> and Appa calling him Jomo. He said, How are you, Jomo? I mean, no one called Jomo Jomo Kenyatta mm. after he became president. Mm. So we were invited in and we had tea with him. Okay. And then Appa Pan said to Kenyatta, I said, uh, Jomo, I'm very disappointed, and that's why I've come. My community is saying that mm -hmm. they are being, after all that they have done, and after all we have done mm -hmm. for independence of Kenya, the way they are being abused in mm -hmm. parliament, mm -hmm. and the, the debate is continuing now. So Kenyatta, in his own way, turned around, and he said, Appa, I invited you for tea. Let's have tea. Let's not talk politics. Mm -hmm. So he and I had tea. And we left without discussing the issue. Okay. But the following day, it had stopped. The debate had stopped. That's he had ordered it to be stopped. Yeah, that's the kind of relationship that uh, Appa Pant had. Yeah. Thank you. It was a great figure, great figure. One, uh, quite apart from his passion yeah. for becoming, getting Africans, Indians together, yeah. quite apart from his passion to get India, Kenya to become independent, uh, this man, I think he... I don't think we ever have a person like this. He was so committed to Kenya's independence and did so much for them. You know, it was mm -hmm. remarkable. I always mention Appa Pant whenever it comes to it. Hopefully there are so guys. many stories about this area where we yeah. live in, you know, where we were not allowed mm -hmm. to own a house. Um, yeah, in mm -hmm. And ourselves, we were almost the first Indians to come here, mm -hmm. or the first non Europeans to come here. Mm -hmm. And we had so much problem with our neighbors. Yeah. And one of the problems, I think I did mention to you. Yes, was the Tiger Club? No, no, was here when we had a dog. Okay. We came from Westlands, oh, we yeah. had a dog who was yeah. barking. Yeah. My mother used to stay with us. <laughs> so our neighbor, a diehard European, mm. came across the fence and told her, ask your dog to shut up. Shut up. This is my tiger. Mm. This is not Parklands where he should be living. All right. So that evening I saw him at a cocktail and went up to him. And I said, Mr. Thornton, mm. I am Rao. He said, oh, the DPP. I said, no, no, I'm not introducing myself. I'm simply telling you, I am Rao. Mm. I am your next door neighbor, but I am an Indian. And my dog is not. I said, my dog is European. <laughs> 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 and he never talked to me after that. <laughs> so those were the kind of problems we had, even coming to live in this area, uh, going into these clubs, which were you know, not open to Indians. Uh, going into some of the hotels which were not open to us, the 
the hospitals were not open to us. Oh, it was just the we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Only hospital they could go to was the Kenyatta Hospital at the so time. So that uh, continued even after the independence. Even after independence, that's when they built the Mpisha Hospital. Mm. That's when Daga Khan built Daga Khan Hospital. Oh. And uh, even the maternity home, there was one maternity home. Mm. My brother was delivered in that maternity home, mm. but most of Indian babies, and I was not delivered there. I was delivered at home. Oh. There was this Indian midwife mm. who came. Mm. came went home and so that's the kind of discrimination mm -hmm. we lived through. Mm -hmm. But when we were young we didn't realize we were living within our own communities, going around doing our own. <laughs> we never faced it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's only after. In fact after I came back from London. Yeah, when you enter your profession life I, yeah. it hit me, you know, right at the start. And mm -hmm. and I fought it through, right the me through.